This is part three of Andrew Jackson's Shifting Legacy. You should be on the third page about halfway down to join along. Have your pen in hand. There are a few focal points or focus points upon which Jackson's modern reputation has turned for better or for worse. One is his attack on corporate privilege and on the concentrated political influence of wealth. So again, as we are reading through this, you are paying attention to those topic sentences because Feller organizes each paragraph around that main point. So now as a reader, I'm paying attention to the ways that Andrew Jackson is going to fight basically the big and rich. In his famous bank veto of 1832, Jackson juxtaposed or compared and set against the rich and powerful against the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, and lamented or mourned that the former too often bend the acts of government for their selfish purposes. No president before and few since have spoken so bluntly of economic antagonisms between Americans. Jackson went on in his farewell address in 1837 to warn of an insidious money power made up of banks and corporations that would steal ordinary citizens' liberties away from them. It said something of Jackson's sense of his own importance that he presumed to deliver a farewell address, an example set by Washington that no previous successor had dared to follow. So basically, the bank veto is a great example of where Jackson sees it all about the rich versus the poor. So I'm gonna annotate that right here. Jackson sees everything as rich versus poor. And guess what, whose side he's saying he's on? Jackson on the side of the average man, the commoner. So naturally, people are going to be supporting him. They think he's on their side by getting rid of these powerful interests, like this bank veto. veto. And then he even imitates George Washington by giving a farewell address, which here Feller is saying is a pretty bold move. The other framing issue for Jackson's recent reputation is Indian removal. So again, this is going to be Feller's main point in this next paragraph. The symbolic freighting of this subject can hardly be overstated. Just as Jackson, child of the frontier, self-made man, homespun military genius, and plain spoken tribune of the people, has sometimes served to stand for everything worth celebrating in American democracy, Indian removal has come to signify democracy's savage and even genocidal underside. It opens a door behind which one finds Jackson, the archetypical, or an example of an Indian hater, the slave owner, the overbearing male patriarch and the frontiersman, not as heroic pioneer, but as imperialist expropriator and killer. Whoa. So take a second and underline some of those phrases that Feller is using to describe Jackson. For many who have seen Jackson's essential importance in his championship of the common man, the little guy, against corporate dominion, Indian removal appeared to be an aside, a little side note. At worst, a regrettable failing, but to many today it shows Jackson and his white man's democracy at its core. Again, I'm expecting Feller to support this in the rest of the paragraph. There's no doubt that removing the American Indians, particularly those in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, was centrally important to Jackson. Together with purging the federal bureaucracy of political opponents and instituting what he called rotation in office, what his enemies dubbed the spoils system, it stood at the head of his initial presidential agenda. So basically, this was a really important part of Jackson's policy. Jackson's motives and methods in pursuing Indian removal were deeply controversial at the time and remain so today. I would underline that. He claimed to be acting only on impulses of duty and philanthropy. American Indians could not, without violating the essential rights of sovereign states, remain where they were. Their own self-preservation required quarantine from pernicious 
or bad white influences, and the terms offered for their evacuation were reasonable and even generous. Critics then and still have branded these as artful rationalizations to cover real motives of greed, racism, and land lust. I want you to underline those three last words, greed, racism, and land lust. So basically, on the one hand, we see Jackson as this big hero fighting, you know, the big rich and powerful. Uh, we remember Jackson most probably for Indian removal. Indian removal, worst part we remember of Jackson's presidency. If you remember, he also puts in the spoils system. It's one of your vocabulary words. Basically, you give political jobs to your supporters and friends. So when he came into office, he gave all of his most important positions to friends of his and people who had supported him, which was controversial then, as it is now. Um, and we have, again, this example of what we could today would call just greed and racism. The recent debate over Jackson's Indian policy has gone mainly one way. The arch oppressor of Indians had become Jackson's prevalent image. Far more American school children can name the Cherokee Trail of Tears, which actually happened in Martin Van Buren's presidency, though it's consequence of Jackson's policy, than the bank veto, the nullification proclamation, or perhaps even the Battle of New Orleans. So again, Indian removal, most remembered. No simple conclusion offers itself. Jackson's reputation, like the man himself, defies easy summary. The one thing that seems certain is that Americans will continue to argue about him. So basically, Jackson will continue to be controversial, which is why we are talking about him in this seminar. All right, you have reached the end of this video. Take time to go back to the beginning of the article and reread your annotations. Take time to underline or box in other keywords. I recommend also skimming through those topic sentences so you can follow Feller's argument. Think again about his main points, that we have trouble remembering what Jackson should be known for. What do we know him for now? And what were the big deals that while he was president? Um, and does the bad take away from the good? So that's for you to decide. Please put your responses to those questions in your notes and you need to continue on with the other readings in this packet.